Fuhai Lake in the grounds of Yuan Ming Yuan, also known as the Old Summer Palace, northwest of Beijing. In the 1980s, the lake was refilled and its banks were restored. But 150 years ago, it covered an even larger area. Earlier still, Emperor Yongzheng had designed charming pavilions on three small islands in the middle of the lake. They evoked the mythological three celestial mountains of the Bohai Sea. By the middle of the Qing Dynasty, the gardens of Yuan Mingyuan spread across 350 acres and contained more than 600 buildings. The complex was known as the Garden of Gardens. On the 6th of October, 1860, this masterpiece in the history of architecture suffered an assault that would culminate in its destruction. That night, a witness of the attack drowned himself in the lake. He was Wen Feng, the official in charge of Yuan Ming Yuan. Highly experienced, he had only recently taken up his appointment. At the time, his future had seemed bright, even though that of the Qing Empire was already uncertain. When British and French troops seized Yuan Ming Yuan, Wang Fun had only two dozen eunuchs armed with swords to resist them. Although they fought bravely, they were no match for troops with modern weapons. Against such unequal odds, Wen Fung knew that he was powerless. According to the records, he faced the inevitable calmly. And he never had the chance to witness the birth of the self-strengthening movement. In March 1861, the New York Times published a report on the aftermath of the Second Opium War. It said that amazing treasures were being sold in Hong Kong. British and French troops, especially members of the French Expeditionary Force, were returning home laden with trophies. One French officer had sold a necklace for 2,000 pounds. The writer of the article saw it for himself. It was made of pearls and jade stone, he said, with 140 pearls as large as cherries. The officer also had a few more precious stones, all evidently the jewels of the emperor himself. Most of this plunder would end up in Europe and America, although the report estimated that at least a million dollars worth had already been sold in Hong Kong. The source of all this loot was the imperial garden of Yuan Ming Yuan. On the 7th of October, 1860, and the few days following, the entire trove of imperial treasures in Yuan Ming Yuan was looted. Then, on the 18th of October, three and a half thousand British troops returned to the complex and set it on fire. The blaze lasted for three days and nights. For the Shenfeng Emperor, who had fled the palace for Rehe province, this was such a heavy blow that he died a year later aged just 30. Between 1722 and 1799, the Yongzheng and Shenlong emperors had devoted every effort to build Yuan Ming Yuan. Now, in the Shengfeng emperor's reign, their legacy had been destroyed. The young emperor was ashamed to face his ancestors. James Hope Grant commanded the British forces of the Anglo-French expedition. After landing at Beitang in Tianjin on the 1st of August, 1860, he captured Beijing in less than three months. There is no record of whether he participated in the looting of Yuan Ming Yuan, but in this photograph, he is pictured leaning on an expensive and exquisite Chinese porcelain urn. His eyes suggest pride and greed. 
After thousands of years in an agricultural civilization, the Chinese people were humble and forbearing. Now, confronted with the aggressive expansion of Western powers, China had to decide whether it would remain conservative and closed, or embark on a journey of self-strengthening. The two opium wars in 1840 and 1860 forced China to open its doors. For most Chinese, the signing of the Treaty of Nanking, among other treaties, was a humiliation. But for the Dao Guang Emperor and his officials, it was a relief. It spared them from having to deal with foreigners demanding direct negotiations with Beijing, and it limited the foreigners to a mere five trading ports. The proof is Qi Ying gained unprecedented power after the war because he had signed the Treaty of Nanking. Apart from a campaign in Guangzhou to refuse entry to foreigners, and the appearance of some publications on foreign countries, there was little sign of the shock that the treaty had delivered to the imperial system. The Convention of Peking stipulated that foreign diplomats would reside in Beijing. Britain and France would each receive increased compensation of 8 million taels of silver, and Tianjin's business areas would be open to foreign residents. Kowloon Peninsula was ceded to Britain. Russia's Count Ignatiev used his role as mediator to induce the Qing government to sign the Treaty of Peking and thus secured for Russia 400,000 square kilometers of territory north of the Heilongjiang River and east of the Wusu Li. But even though its sovereignty was violated time and again, the Qing government still maintained its closed-door policies and ignored the advanced technology of the West. China Prior to the First Opium War, the Qing Dynasty had ruled China for centuries while ignoring the existence of the West. After the war, the Qing government was actually under Western domination, yet still could not face the fact that the West was stronger than itself. The Qing government still insisted on the superiority of Chinese civilization and believed that the barbarian enemies were devoid of culture. Any attempt at learning from the West would be incompatible with the principle of guarding Chinese culture and despising foreign cultures. Several treaties stemming from the Second Opium War granted foreign countries privileged status within China, concessions that remained in force even after the Yalta Conference of 1945. The Anglo-French forces had occupied the capital, forcing the emperor to flee. They then burned down the imperial garden, humiliating the ancient civilization that claimed to be the center of the world. Four years later, the Qing government did finally manage to put down the Taiping Rebellion, although this was entirely a domestic conflict. During the temporary peace that ensued, a number of scholar officials began to reflect on the reasons for the recent decades of domestic and international turmoil. Their debates led to China's first attempt at modernization. The 1860s saw the start of the self-strengthening movement. The movement had three objectives, to improve the strength of the nation, to increase its wealth, and to train the population in practical skills. It aimed to enhance the Qing Empire's ability to defend itself against invasion and to suppress civil unrest, 
while revitalizing the nation. In short, to begin China's modernization. Yet this seemingly vigorous movement petered out. What caused it to fail? Yang 而林则徐魏元为了启蒙中国人变得书most of the advocates for westernization were Han officials, such as Tsun Guofan, Zhuo Chungtang, and Li Hongzhang, all of whom had excelled in the imperial examinations. In line with the Qing strategy of allowing Han to manage Han, they had been able to exert their influence during the Taiping Rebellion. But the Qing policy of promoting Manchus meant they had to be extra cautious the conservative forces within the Qing dynasty were still strong, but some high-ranking officials also supported the movement for westernization. Tai 他觉得既然是这样的话,那我们甚至可以跟他合作。他并没有要推翻我。所以他支持用洋枪洋炮。One day in 1864, a warship approached Tianjin carrying the new Prussian minister to China, Guido von Reifus. The minister noticed three Danish merchant vessels off the port of Daguko. Since Prussia and Denmark were at war in Europe, he ordered the capture of the Danish vessels as prizes. The American missionary William Alexander Parsons Martin had just completed the Chinese translation of the elements of international law for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. As a result, Qing officials refused the minister entry into Beijing on the grounds that it was illegal to extend a European war into Chinese territorial waters. Von Reifus was obliged to release the Danish vessels and pay compensation. The far-sighted official behind the Chinese action was the Prince Regent Prince Gung. Subsequently, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued 300 copies of the elements of international law to provincial officials, urging them to use international conventions to protect China's national interests. The Dao Guang Emperor had nine sons. His fourth son became the Shen Feng Emperor, and his sixth son was Prince Gong. Prince Gong was intelligent, courageous, and decisive. In 1861, he remained behind in Beijing to negotiate with the British and French, signing a number of what became known as the Unequal Treaties. He and Grand Secretaries Gui Liang and Wen Xiang submitted a memorial with six proposals relating to foreign affairs. The memorial represented a comprehensive response to the failure of the Qing rulers during the two opium wars. 
in finally recognizing the strength of Russia, Britain, France, and the United States. It was a major breakthrough. Whether these countries were enemies or allies, China faced the loss of its national interests if nothing was done. The Xianfeng Emperor had no choice but to approve the memorial. The six proposals included setting up a designated Ministry of Foreign Affairs, appointing a trade minister in Tianjin to manage three ports in the north, recruiting two foreign language translators from Guangdong and Shanghai to work in Beijing, selecting boys under the age of 14 from the eight banners to study foreign languages, and collecting domestic and international business intelligence to submit monthly to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. While none of this meant that the Qing rulers were willing to understand the changing world, it showed at the very least that they had accepted the reality. So in 1868年的第一公信王给朝廷写了这个善后六六条这是决定后来几十年自强运动的一个纲领性文件它是决定后来几十年就这样它的逻辑关联什么呢中国只有建立一个强大的军队强大的军队还必须从海军开始从水军开始因为原来是中国农业文明嘛农业文明没有这么水军呐我们的沿海只要筑炮台就行了筑炮台就可以了那么现在就是海军要有这些东西这是这是这是这个那么要有海军就要有
the Qing rulers realized it was time to reform the traditional eight banners and green standard armies. But although the new Shang and Huai armies had considerable combat capability, they still lagged behind foreign armies in equipment and officer training. After the Second Opium War, Western interests in China were closely aligned with those of the Qing dynasty. So Western countries constantly urged the Qing rulers to train new armed forces. In 1862, two battalions and an artillery unit using British and Russian weapons began training in Zhili under 17 British officers. This was China's first modern army. Training the new army took center stage in the late Qing dynasty, and the new troops played an important part in later history. However, the cost was high. Opponents of westernization called for an end to the movement, saying it was draining the treasury. But Li Hongzhang and Sun Guofan insisted it absolutely could not stop. So where was the money to come from? In September 1876, Li Hongzhang told the court, China is poor because of poverty. He pointed out that the nation must first be affluent, especially in terms of people's livelihoods, before it can be powerful and achieve stability. From then on, various civilian industries were established on a large scale. The breakthrough came with the shipping industry. Chongwazi 另外一方面因为这个两次鸦片战争之后购买外国的这个大型的蒸汽动力的轮船 the Merchant History Museum holds the records of this pioneering industrial and commercial venture. The Qing dynasty had rejected the idea of private businesses managing shipping, and it had imposed restrictive prohibitions on routes and docking. Foreign affairs officials, led by Li Hongzhang, called for them to be allowed to establish their own shipping companies. If I can't ban Chinese businesses from using foreign ships, he said, then why ban them from buying ships themselves? In 1873, the Qing rulers finally broke with their traditional thinking and established a shipping merchants group in Shanghai. The government set the company up and private capital was invested in it. Its operations combined government supervision and private management. Yoyipang 
，又懂得这个外国的现代化的企业、现代化机器嘛，他们特别想办，但是政府、清政府压制，不许可。所以，洋务运动为什么开始只能官办？因为连官办，连郑作礼，大家知道那么大的权利，他遇到还有那么大的阻力，你民间办，他根本就不许可。清政府的财政一直非常困难。而这些生产现代化的枪炮是极其费钱的，财政有点维持不下去了。唯一的办法不是停，而是想办法赚钱。怎么赚钱？由政府生产民用品、用机器，从生产枪炮，同时还要生产民用品。这时候，洋务运动就从求强变为这个求富。Today's Kai Luan coal mine used to be called the Kai Ping mine. With the growth of the defence industry, coal and other energy sources became increasingly scarce. So Li Hongzhang and others suggested mining coal on a large scale. By 1884, 12 coal mines had been opened, mostly as government-supervised merchant undertakings. Li Hongzhang also converted the Imperial Telegraph Administration to a government-supervised undertaking backed by private funds. By the war of 1894, it had funded over 23,000 kilometers of telegraph wires, stretching northeast to Heilongjiang, northwest to Gansu and Xinjiang, southeast to Fujian and Taiwan, and southwest to Guangxi and Yunnan. To create a national telegraph network, within three short decades of the Second Opium War, China had progressed from a society completely shielded from and oblivious to the outside world, to building modern ships and constructing a railway and telegraph network. Nor was the unprecedented rate of change limited to factories and infrastructure. Foreign relations traditionally fell under the jurisdiction of three different departments: the ministries of rights, tributary affairs, and state ceremonial. Their main task was to receive the envoys who arrived in Beijing for the annual New Year's Day celebration. Countries received by the Ministry of Rights were considered allies. Western countries trading in Guangzhou came under Guangzhou military jurisdiction, but as China's doors gradually opened with the constant arrival of Western ships, more and more Westerners began to show up in all corners of the ancient empire. This exposure to the West led more and more Chinese to look to the world beyond their nation's doors. In 1862, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Founded the School of Combined Learning in Beijing to teach Western languages. In 1864, a language school was established in Shanghai. Others followed in Hubei, Xinjiang, Taiwan, and Guangzhou. Meanwhile, the Fuzhou Naval College and the Tianjin Naval and Military Academies were the forerunners of China's first military institute. In 1872. After mulling it over for a full ten years, the Qing government decided to send thirty young boys to the United States every four years. They were led by China's first international student, Rong Hong, a graduate of Yale University. They went on to study law, politics, engineering, mining, chemistry, and other subjects. One of them was Zhang Tianyu, China's first railway engineer. Meanwhile, the ship bureau minister Shun Baojun sent other students to Britain and France. One group that achieved outstanding results in France went on to become the core of the future navy. They included Sa Junbing, Zhang Tianyu, Liu Buchan, Yan Chongguang, and Fang Boqian. Meanwhile, institutions such as the School of Combined Learning began translating a large number of Western works. Texts about Western politics, law, military theory, engineering, science, and history made their way into China, giving the Chinese a better understanding of the world than earlier in the 19th century. In 
In 1875, Guo Sung Tao, who had strong ties with Tsung Guo Fan and Zhuo Tsung Tang, became the Qing Empire's first minister to Britain. The Chinese government finally appeared to be on track with its foreign relations. But the nation-state system of international law that the Western countries had established in the course of the 19th century was still quite unfamiliar to the Chinese rulers, who had just gone through a decade of reform. Gordon 作为范本学习的你要了解外国是怎么回事那么光照在这里边就描写了西方的政治制度郁郁而终嘛 Guo Song Tao wasn't the only Qing official to suffer depression during the westernization movement. All of their lives were overshadowed by the inevitable contact and collision with the West. For example, Hu Lin Yi, an imperial scholar during the Dao Guang period, was known for his efforts to suppress the Taiping rebellion. Hu Lin Yi was a minister of ability, achievement and loyalty. Yet he felt an inexplicable sense of dread of foreigners whenever he saw foreign steamers advancing along the Yangtze River. Succumbing to anxiety, he fell sick and died. Tsung Guo Fan, on the other hand, was very different. In 1862, he built a steamship in Anqing but it failed on its trial voyage. Rather than becoming discouraged, he was even more determined to discover the secret of building ships and armaments in an effort to break the foreign monopoly on advanced weapons. However, figures like Tsung Guo Fun were rare. Even in the foreign ministry, officials held highly divergent attitudes towards Western civilization. More often than not, they tended to resist learning and change. After the Opium Wars, the Qing dynasty was in decline. Changes in outlook and the self-strengthening movement seemed unable to overcome the breakdown caused by failed confrontations with foreign civilizations. Defeat in the War of 1894 was a heavy blow to the whole of the Qing dynasty. The westernization movement, with its precept of traditional learning as the body, western learning as the armor, began to seem ineffectual. Naholetu 更没有文化的改革和这种其他的这种国民心理素质的改造 Westernizing ministers were the power behind the self-strengthening movement, while at court the movement was led by Prince Gong. 
Unfortunately, even the powerful prince was like a chess piece in the hands of the still more powerful Empress Dowager Sir Shi. On his deathbed in 1861, the Shen Feng Emperor decided to leave his already turbulent empire to his eldest son, Tsai Chun, who was only six. That moment would determine the fate of the Qing dynasty. Over the next 50 years, Tsai Chun and his successors did not actually rule the country. The real power lay with the new emperor's mother, Empress Dowager Sir Shi. She ruled the empire for half a century. In 1861, Prince Gung helped Sir Shi stage a coup that destroyed the network of regents appointed by the Shen Feng Emperor. From then on, he became a pawn of the Empress Dowager. Yet she remained constantly wary of his growing power. After the successful negotiations with Britain and France, Prince Gung became the head of the Grand Council and the Minister of Political Affairs, Foreign Affairs and the Interior. This made him the dynasty's most powerful political figure. It also made the Empress Dowager watchful. In 1884, the Sino-French War broke out in Vietnam. The Grand Council, led by Prince Gong, was unable to reach a consensus about intervening. The Empress Dowager used this to remove him from all of his positions. The Qing government never had competent leadership again. Hadiwin 所以说只能说中国的自强运动是由于中国的这个土壤或者当时的社会政治体制决定了他们没有像日本明治维新走的那么远因为当时他们遇到的阻力太大。Prince Gong was succeeded by Prince Chun, director of the Navy office, and Prince Li, the Grand Minister of State. They were mediocre leaders and seemed even more incompetent when conservative officials subjected them to a barrage of reproach and obstruction. The westernization movement relied heavily on the management of local officials, but every decision was met with attacks from conservatives. These were mostly poetry-loving bureaucrats who resented the aggression of foreign powers and considered any compromise or negotiation to be a national insult and weakness. They viewed any study of the West as a desecration of Chinese civilization. While this level of cultural integrity might be admirable in theory, it often achieved nothing and could make the situation even worse. Kashibanahanhao 那么有一些官员一直反对这个的始终借着说这是关起那里面有贪污的没有要查账一次一直查账都对这些企业就造成损害包括他的音乐刚才讲了说关起他的这个贪污腐败尤其后来产权不清双方在那争一出现这种争执
finally brought the movement to an end, but it provided valuable experience. In 1887, the Tianjin Military Academy was trying to replicate Western manufacturing methods. It made a small hydrogen balloon, but the rope broke during the test release and the balloon drifted westward. The authorities issued a notice. If the balloon is found by military, civilian or other personnel, record the date and time discovered and return it to the academy. Upon delivery, travel expenses plus 10 tails of silver will be paid. In August that year, the academy held another test flight with both the Navy and the Shenyang military commander present. It was China's first trial production and release of its own manned balloon. The launch of this small hydrogen balloon was the breakthrough many people had been waiting for. Although attempts at modern industrialization had faltered under the old system, China had continued to explore advanced Western technology and was beginning to enter the world stage. For the Chinese people, Continuing this centuries-old self-strengthening philosophy is as important today as it has ever been. <laughs>